Whenever addressing the subject of God, we should start by recognizing that there are two separate debates here that often get tangled up together. The one debate is over whether or not God exists, and the other debate is over whether or not the belief in God is good for society. A yes answer to one of those questions is not necessarily a yes answer to the other question. Well, in this book that I just finished, The Rage Against God by Peter Hitchens, he does not attempt to answer the first question, whether or not God exists. He focuses on the second question, whether or not the belief in God is good for society. And part of the way he addresses that is by looking at anti-theistic societies and the harm that they cause. He doesn't deny that there is a bloody history of Christianity, just like there's a bloody history of every religion. But isn't human history very bloody? Isn't human history for, full of war and genocide? It's just unfortunate, but that's the way the world seems to be. The argument of many anti-theists, and I want you to note that an atheist who doesn't believe in God is not necessarily an anti-theist, but an anti-theist who is against God, who is against the belief in God, Many an anti-theist, like Richard Dawkins, will argue that Christianity and other religions have caused great bloodshed, and they can certainly cherry-pick through history to try to prove their point. What they assume, however, is that these wars that were waged in the name of religion actually were caused by religion. They really have no significant evidence for that, and they assume that without the religion these wars would not have happened. Furthermore, they ignore many other points in history where Christian nations have existed in relative peace and harmony. Now, for those of us on the pro-God side, and you don't necessarily have to believe in God, by the way, to be on this side, but those of us on this side, we don't really have to cherry-pick through history. And that's a point I kind of want to add to his argument here. The few examples in human history of truly godless regimes, and I don't mean secular regimes run by people who tend to be Christian or tend to believe in God, that would be the United States, but truly godless regimes run by atheists who hate God and want to remove God from every aspect of society. Well, every single example of them is soaked, drenched in the blood of the innocent. The particular example that Peter Hitchens holds up is the Soviet Union. And I don't think I need to go into the long history of bloodshed in that empire. But the Soviet Union had no tolerance for religion, and they did not need religion to persecute the masses. Perhaps with religion, there might have even been some constraints. That's one of his main points here. With religion comes a certain moral code and a certain humility, a belief that there's a greater power. But there's no such moral code, no such humility in the lack of belief in God. Atheists, at best, might believe that humans can create a moral code. But they don't believe in a moral code outside themselves because there's nothing outside themselves to create such a moral code. And that really is at the root of his criticism of anti-theism. So basically his argument is that Christianity will not make the world a perfect place, but Christianity does make the world a better place. And he articulates that very well by pointing out the civility that is still to be found in Great Britain. Despite the decline in religion, Britain, as he says, is still in the afterglow of Christianity and many of the customs and practices that are rooted in religion are still present in Britain and will be at least for some time. I'm going to add further to his argument. The very ideology of classical liberalism, the very ideology that many anti-theists will cherry-pick through in order to push their agenda, well, that ideology is rooted in Christian thinkers, and furthermore, it is rooted in Christian philosophy. It's actually rooted in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto the Lord that which is the Lord's. By that, he was recognizing a separation of church and state. He was recognizing that we should have one loyalty to the civil authorities, in that case the Roman Empire, 
and a separate loyalty to the established church or synagogue or temple of his time. I could certainly go on and on, and the thinker Roger Scruton would probably articulate this better than I would, but the whole point is, secular liberalism, ironically, is actually rooted in Christian philosophy, and the anti-theist is holding up Christian ideals when they hold up these ideas. Now, the anti-theists can certainly be part of this Christian ideal, but if they seek to persecute Christians in the name of that ideal, they turn the whole ideal on its head. And that is the ultimate grand hypocrisy of anti-theism. And it's also the grand hypocrisy of this totalitarian brand of pseudo-liberalism that seems to be taking over much of Europe today. There's also such elements to be found here in the United States, but they're much weaker. You can find many of them here on YouTube, and I'd rather not give them any attention, but they certainly exist here. A um, couple of final notes I want to make. On a personal note, I want to say to Peter Hitchens, if you ever see this video, thank you. I spent some time in England, a little over a year and a half, and I didn't have a very good experience. It left me with a bitter taste in my mouth, and from what you describe here, I think you can imagine why. For a little while, I was angry at England, but that anger has recently passed, and it's in part thanks to this book. I realize now that it, it's not England that I was angry with, it's the ugly side of England, the side that I unfortunately was immersed in. That ugly side of England is very powerful in London. It's much weaker in the north of England, other parts of England, I'm sure. But to the English people who care about your traditions, and to Peter Hitchens, let, let me offer you some advice. I couldn't help but notice in the end, Peter Hitchens, that you sort of touched on a fallacy. The fallacy being that the growth of Islam is somehow equivalent to the decline in Christianity. You mentioned that the next king might be coronated in a multi-faith ceremony. Well, if the king is coronated in a multi-faith ceremony, that's not part of the rage against God, is it? After all, don't Muslims also believe in God? Don't they love God? Don't Hindus love God and Jewish people and so many other faiths? England becoming multi-faith is not something I think you should be worried about. Remember that a new mosque does not mean the absence of one church. One more mosque is not one less church. The growth of Islam does not mean the decline of Christianity. There's no reason that the two faiths can't grow together. The reason I keep mentioning Islam in particular is it probably is the fastest growing religion in England right now, and it's the one that many English conservatives are worried about. Well, the totalitarian pseudo-liberals want you to be angry with Islam. They want to hold that up as an example that you're backwards and prejudiced. My advice is completely turn the tables on them. Embrace your Islamic brothers. They are not part of the problem. They are not a threat to you. And they are not so foolish as to think that these pseudo-liberals are really their friends. I had many Islamic friends when I was in England. I was a little put off by them at first, I admit, because when I first went to England, I expected to find England, and I didn't find England, at least not very much of it. The Muslims are certainly different. They are a different culture, but at least they're a culture. The pseudo-liberals, as you know, they bring down culture. They bring down civilization. We saw that in the Soviet Union. The ruins of a once great Russian civilization are described in this book. That is the inevitable result of their totalitarianism. They want to remove anything that gets in the way of their power. Now, the very last thing I want to do is elaborate further on one of his criticisms of the anti-theist. He quoted Richard Dawkins as having said that the only thing worse than the Catholic priests molesting children is having raised them to be Catholic in the first place. Richard Dawkins has been known to say this many times. I don't know if he's retracted that statement since. But if he has not, I definitely want to address this. If we were to follow that logic, then it leads to the conclusion 
that child molestation is not as bad as Catholicism. It leads to the conclusion that a child would be better off in an atheistic family that molests them than a Catholic family that doesn't molest them. To Richard Dawkins, if you ever see this, think about this for a moment. If we were to randomly select a group of people who had been molested as children but are not Catholic, and we were to ask them, would you rather have been molested or have been Catholic? How many of them do you think would say molested? I think we both know the answer to that. It's probably a big fat zero. I think that what Richard Dawkins said was just very disrespectful to people who have suffered, who have been molested. I've never been through that, thank God Almighty, but I can't imagine what they have been through. And I would never cheapen the horrors of what they have been through by using it as an opportunity to attack a certain group of people. I think that Richard Dawkins owes an apology to victims of molestation everywhere. Thank you all for watching my video. I hope you will read this book, whether you are a believer in God or even if you're an anti-theist. And to the anti-theist out there, I think you will find Peter Hitchens far more articulate than many of the fundamentalists that you're more accustomed to and perhaps more comfortable with arguing against. Thank you.